Your eminence, reverend fathers, sisters and brothers, Christ is in our midst. It's a joy to speak with you all today. And I want to thank Archdeacon Joseph in particular for the invitation to speak. I only wish that I could be with you there in person, but alas, I am home in Connecticut where it's very hot. Today I'm going to take about uh, 30 minutes to introduce you to one of the most interesting and inspiring modern saints, Saint Mother Maria Skopsova of Paris. I'm sure some of you have heard of her and know something about her life. And I know we're going to get a more intimate portrait of her later today. But most people don't know much about the group that she founded called Orthodox Action. Orthodox Action was a group dedicated to the poor, sick, and infirm among Russian emigres in France in the 1930s and 40s. Not only did they engage in social action at an impressive scale, especially given their meager resources, they also wrote some incredible things on Orthodox social theology, that is, question of the task of the Orthodox Church in the world today, in society. So first I'm gonna briefly give the story of the life of St. Mother Maria, and then talk about the work of Orthodox action, and finally about the theology that they wrote, which grew out of their work with the poor and marginalized. I think this topic is of special urgency for us today as Orthodox Christians seeking to go out into the world, uh, a world that's torn apart right now by war and strife and division, and even the church itself is also experiencing these tragedies. But ultimately, this is a story about, uh, is about hope. Hope that even in small numbers, even doing small things in our communities, we are involved with the work of Christ's redemption of the entire creation, both within our hearts and in the world around us. Mother Maria was born Elizaveta or Liza Pilenko in 1891 in Russia on a town in the Black Sea to a relatively well-off family. She had a joyful childhood until 1906 when her father died prematurely at the age of 49. As she would describe it later, it was then that her childhood ended. She had a crisis of faith as the result of her father's death and threw herself into revolutionary politics, which were on the rise in Russia at the time. In 1910, at the age of 19, she married a member of Vladimir Lenin's Bolshevik party. He was also part of the Russian intelligentsia, the intellectual avant-garde who mainly hung out in St. Petersburg. There she encountered not only revolutionaries, but also poets, philosophers, and even priests and theologians sympathetic to the idea of reorganizing Russian society and even the Russian Orthodox Church. She was herself an active member of this subculture as a poet, publishing a couple of well-received volumes of poetry in the 19-teens. Now, as she would describe it later, these brilliant intellectuals and writers possessed astonishing theories and ideas, but the one thing that they lacked was faith, faith really in anything at all. The world for them, she said, was a stage for the play of abstract ideas. So she um, sort of left this, this, this milieu, she divorced, her, she divorced her husband, and she ended up having a child with someone else. Uh, she had an affair with an unknown Russian man and had a daughter named Guyana. Mother Maria, who was at the time still Lisa, was not long for Russia after this. During the tumultuous year of 1917, when the Russian Revolution began, she had joined the Socialist Revolutionary Party, which was one of the many parties at the time that was jockeying for power as the uh, monarchy was falling. And she became the mayor of her hometown on the Black Sea. But after uh, Vladimir Lenin's coup d'etat, uh, Mother Maria's comparatively moderate party was forcibly pushed out by the Bolsheviks. Mother Maria herself, who never shied away from criticizing Bolshevik violence and excess, narrowly escaped a death sentence. As she would describe it, despite her firm socialist views at the time, she could never abandon the worth of the individual in favor of the collective. To hold together a balance between care for the person on the one hand and care for the collective on the other hand, was a task that she would pursue for the rest of her life. The man who interceded for her and saved her from a fate of capital punishment was a judge named Daniel Skopsov, and he would eventually become her second husband. Um, even after their eventual divorce, which I'll talk about in a minute, they remained friends, united by the children they had together, Yura and Nastya. Eventually, the Skopsovs had to flee Russia, and after a few years in exile, 
they arrived with no money in France in 1923. Lisa's early life in France was one of intense hardship. The most difficult of all was the death of her daughter Nastia in 1926. This tragedy completely altered the trajectory of her life. And here's what she wrote, you can see on quote number one. At Nastia's side, I feel that my soul has meandered down back alleys all my life. And now I want an authentic and a purified road, not out of faith in life, but in order to justify, understand, and accept death. No amount of thought will ever result in any greater formulation than the three words, love one another, so long as it is love to the end and without exceptions. And then the whole of life is illumined, which is otherwise an abomination and a burden. This dual revelation that true life was bound up somehow with death and that there was no greater purpose in life than to love one another would inform the rest of her path in this world. Soon she joined the Russian student Christian movement, a group of Orthodox emigres in Europe who held conferences, camps, and engaged in social work. And she became a kind of missionary with the movement traveling around France and giving lectures. And on these trips, she often, often encountered the poorest of the poor, refugees driven to despair and resentment, often addicted to alcohol. Encountering these wretched of the earth, she stuck to her earlier commitment to placing absolute value in the person, no matter who they were. She wrote this imaginary dialogue about these encounters, uh, quote number two. Are they degraded? Degraded indeed. Decayed? Decaying alive. Drunk, debauched, dishonest, thieving? Yes, and yes again. Are they people? Utterly and undeniably miserable and abandoned people whom a human word can yet reclaim so that no trace of debauchery and lies remains. But who could speak such a human word? Well, Mother Maria found that she could. People sensed her intense ability to empathize and they would line up to talk to her almost like a line for confession in the church. She had an uncanny ability to co-suffer with others to find their humanity and indeed to help them find it for themselves. In her motherly spirit, she said that she wanted to hold each of these people in her heart and rock them to sleep. But she was only one person and there were limits to what she could do by herself. She wrote this in a poem uh, in poetry it was often how she would express her inner thoughts and feelings. So quote number three, again, I leave the poorer for some more distant part. The world try as one might will not fit into one heart. The tragic death of her other daughter, Guyana, a few years later, confirmed in her this understanding of her calling to be a mother, a mother to all. She wrote, I became aware of a new and special broad and all embracing motherhood. I saw a new road before me and a new meaning in life. She wished to be, quote, a mother for all, for all who needed maternal care, assistance or protection. Now, as this calling developed in her, she began to believe that could, it could only be lived out in monastic life. She and her husband, Daniel, received an ecclesiastical divorce, which according to the canons of the church is necessary if a spouse wants to take monastic vows and Daniel agreed. And so in the spring of 1932, Lisa Skopsova took her monastic vows and became Mother Maria. Now hers was a very peculiar form of monasticism. There was no organized Russian Orthodox monastery in Western Europe at the time. And in fact, when Metropolitan Yevlogi, who was the, um, the Bishop of Russians in Western Europe at that time, when he tonsured her as a nun, he hoped that she might organize a monastic community. But upon visiting traditional Orthodox monasteries in places like Estonia and Latvia, those that were still open, she felt stifled by the cloistered life. Her monasticism was to be an outward world-facing monasticism. She wrote, at present, monastics possess only one monastery, the whole wide world. And yet she also wrote, the more we go out into the world, the more we give ourselves to the world, the less we are of the world. For the worldly do not give the world an offering of themselves. Always with Mother Maria, the most properly Christian mode of life 
for monastics or non-monastics was sacrifice, the gift of self to the world. Now I want to talk uh, a little bit about Orthodox Action, the organization that was founded by Mother Maria. So after her tonsure, as I said, rather than moving into a monastery, she found a house. And this was not going to be a house for future nuns, uh, but rather a place for those who needed food and shelter. At first, the only place she could find in Paris was in a relatively prosperous district, which was sort of inappropriate for her purposes. And it only held about nine people at a time. So, uh, but she made do for a couple of years. She converted one room into a chapel and then slept on the floor under the staircase while guests stayed in the rooms. But after two years, it became clear that her mission had outgrown that space. So she gathered support and bought a large abandoned house at 77 Rue de Lormel in Paris's 15th uh, arrondissement, a poor district where many Russian emigres lived at the time. Now this house was able to hold dozens of people and had rooms large enough to feed 100 at a time. And indeed they would feed uh, sometimes 100 meals a day for many years. Here too, Mother Maria had a chapel built and she painted many of the icons herself and created uh, large embroideries, which is a craft that she really excelled at. You can see here are some of uh, examples of her, of her work. The patrons at 77 Rue de Lormel were the unemployed, there were people on government assistance, there were those caught in addiction or prostitution or those simply behind on net. It was a temporary haven for hundreds of people over the years and it was the center of Mother Maria's activities. It also became a hub of intellectual life among Orthodox emigres. There was a steady schedule of lectures and presentations by some of the leading thinkers of the emigration, personal friends of Mother Maria's, such as the philosopher Nikolai Berdyaev, the historian George Gedotov, and the theologian Father Sergei Bulgakov, who was also her spiritual father. Father Lev Gillet, who sometimes goes by a monk of the Eastern Church, maybe you've read some of his books, he lived there uh, in the mid thirties and served at the chapel. And he had this to say about this peculiar sort of monastery. He says, quote, it is a strange pandemonium. We have young girls, madmen, exiles, unemployed workers, and at the moment, the choir of the Russian opera and the Gregorian choir of Dom Malheur, a missionary center. And now we have services in the chapel every morning and evening. So it's this interesting blend of the poor, um, the artists and the chapel. Mother Maria also organized a course to train chanters for church services and was able to produce 10 well-trained singers uh, by the end of the first year. But much of Mother Maria's days at 77 Rue de Lormel were spent fetching cast-offs and cheap food around the various storehouses of Paris and bakeries, and then cooking it in the kitchen at the house. Exhausting as it was, Mother Maria was always cheerful. She was always available with a listening ear, a sly smile, and a big laugh. You can see it a little bit in these photos. Her monastic rule, such as it was, was irregular. Uh, she might have said that she abided by the rule of love, or what she might have also called the economy of love. And she wrote about it like this, quote number four here. This world thinks if I gave my love, then I'm less well off in respect of such and such a quantity of love. Well, if I were to give the world of my soul, then I would be left utterly bankrupt and there would be no point in trying to save anyone at all. But the laws of the spiritual life in this area are diametrically opposed to material laws. In accordance with these, whatever of one's spiritual wealth is given away, not only reverts to the donor, like the ruble, which can't be changed, but is increased and consolidated. Whoever gives receives, whoever impoverishes himself gains in wealth. By 1934, Mother Maria perceived that her work needed some organizing. She needed an organization. The name Orthodox Action was proposed by the philosopher Berdyaev. It was a simple name uh, and it expressed the intentions of the, of the organization. The group was to be an expression of orthodoxy and it was to concern itself with action, with the carrying out of a common task. On the September feast of the exaltation of the cross in 1935, the divine liturgy was celebrated at the house of Lormel and Father Sergei Bulgakov, the spiritual father of the organization presided. 
Metropolitan Yavlogi was in attendance and formally gave his blessing for Orthodox action and was its honorary president. Notably, Metropolitan Yavlogi specified that Orthodox action should consider itself an organization independent of church hierarchy, completely free uh, and yet blessed by the church. And so Orthodox action consolidated, organized and expanded the work begun by Mother Maria at 77 Rue de Lormel. What were some of their projects? Well, one of the first things they did was to set up weekly schools in various neighborhoods in Paris. One at Lormel, another nearby in the 15th arrondissement, another in the industrial suburb of Montrouge. Education, both religious and secular, was always a big emphasis for orthodox action because after all, many of its founders were educators or clergy or intellectuals. Orthodox action also established rest homes for the wandering destitute who needed food and shelter. One of the activities that occupied Mother Maria and what she was somewhat famous for in Paris was going through the highways and byways of the city to find desperate and drunk people and sometimes to literally drag them to one of their houses. One of the largest places they acquired was in the remote Eastern suburb of Paris, noisy le grand And there Mother Maria built another chapel and dedicated part of the property to be a sanatorium for patients suffering with tuberculosis, which was how her daughter Guyana had died. This center would survive for decades, even after World War II. Orthodox action employed a small but significant number of people to staff these centers. Many of the staff were people whom Mother Maria found and freed from mental hospitals. In the late 1930s, Mother Maria conducted an organized survey of the mental hospitals in France. She wanted to know how many Russian speaking patients were being held in these facilities and if any of them could be released. Many of the Russian speaking patients at these really decrepit hospitals had experienced the Russian Civil War or World War I and had serious cases of what we would call today post-traumatic stress disorder. And it didn't help that almost none of them spoke French, so they were silent most of the time. In one hospital, she spent a day and a half interviewing all 51 of its Russian speakers and concluded that eight of them were only mildly disturbed, if at all. She presented her results to the staff, and then the people were interviewed again with Mother Maria acting as interpreter. And in the end, three people were released immediately and a few others were given partial freedom. So Mother Maria concluded that if around 8% of the Russian speaking patients at this one hospital could be released, then dozens if not hundreds more in other hospitals also awaited their release. So immediately they formed a committee and indeed they were able to release dozens of uh, mental patients. Mother Maria's work was recognized by the French authorities who promised to build a center that would house 400 such patients as they transitioned back to normal life. But unfortunately, this larger scale project was thwarted by um, the start of World War II. One of the beautiful results of Orthodox action was to unite local parishes and the people within them. And this is how Metropolitan Yavlogi described this effect. You can see him here, he's seated with her and Father Bulgakov. He says, all these institutions, of, um, and he names a few, are part of orthodox action, which extends its activity beyond them. Participants are active in parishes in the outskirts of Paris, organizing schools, conferences, lectures, literary gatherings. And they also organize representatives of several parishes, which is a very interesting initiative, actively reinforcing mutual contacts between them. So orthodox action had the effect of kind of unifying uh, the parishes in the, in the region. Now, how did they fund all these projects? After all, the founders and staff were poor emigres and most of the kind of Slavic uh, churches in Western Europe at the time had really no money. So actually much of the money came from the Anglican church, uh, ecumenical and international agencies, including the American YMCA. And without such funding from these other churches and organizations who rightly saw the incredible work and energy of Orthodox action and Mother Maria in particular, uh, it could not have accomplished all that it did. Now the coming of World War II and the Nazi occupation of France changed Orthodox action's mission significantly. In addition to their normal work of feeding, clothing, housing, and educating, they became very actively involved with the resistance and notably took a leading role in protecting Jews. 
For example, when in 1941, the Nazi regime began to aggressively seek out Jews in France and arrest them, a baptismal certificate or a certificate of church membership could serve as a means of evading Nazi authorities. Father Dimitri uh, Klepinin, who was by then the serving priest at 77 Rue de Lonel, produced dozens and dozens of these kinds of certificates for Jews, uh, risking his own life, but saving scores of people from arrest, arrest uh, deportation, or death. Other Orthodox priests in France also contributed to this effort. But eventually the resistance of Orthodox action was found out by the Nazis and many, many of its members, including Mother Maria herself, were arrested. She was sent to the Ravensbrück concentration camp in 1943, which effectively dissolved Orthodox action. Uh, after two years at the camp, and you can see some of the things that she made uh, as a, um, at the concentration camp. And after two years, um, Mother Maria died in a gas chamber on Holy Saturday in 1945 reportedly volunteering to die in exchange for a Jewish prisoner. She was canonized in 2004 and was also declared righteous among the nations by Yad Vashem, um, Israel's official memorial organization for the victims of the Holocaust. Okay, so far I've talked about the life <clears throat> and work of Mother Maria and Orthodox action. And in this final part of the presentation, I want to talk a little bit more about the theology of Orthodox action. As we've seen, Orthodox action was at once a practical enterprise, a liturgical enterprise, and it was also a theological enterprise. All these emphases took place in the concrete life of Orthodox action centers, which with, uh, with, with meals, religious services, and lectures and classes all happening in the same kinds of, in the same place at the same center. Orthodox actions theology, I believe, is extremely vital today for us as Orthodox Christians. What were their particular, what was their particular approach uh, to theology? I wanna highlight three points. Mother Maria and Orthodox action did not set out to sort of create a theory and then apply it, like a theory of social action. Rather, the theology that they articulated throughout the 1930s was derived from their work of responding to the various needs that arose in their communities, whatever they happened to have to do. In an article from 1935 called Orthodox Action, which she wrote um, kind of as a manifesto at the beginning of the organization, Mother Maria wrote about her frustration with theoretical discussions about politics or society. Here's how the article began, if you look at quote number five. It is unbearable to hear or read any theoretical discussions about the organization of life. From university departments and heated debates in various meetings, people are trying to squeeze life into schemas and forms to hammer its irreconcilable multiformity into molds determined in advance. Politicians predicting what's going to happen decades from now, get lost and confused amidst the little things of the present day. Economists, knowing how to solve all conflicts and crises, cannot make ends meet in their measly budgets. Altruists, wishing to help out the whole universe, do not notice the living human being beside them." End quote. This last point is important. In the opinion of Mother Maria, the danger of spending all your time theorizing about politics and society is that it can cause you to forget the one thing needful, the living human being beside you. Orthodox action always held the person and his or her concrete life situation as the first principle. Not a grand theory of the universe, but the experience of the other, of my neighbor. Yet at the same time, the experience of the other before me was not a cause for an individualist approach. I and my neighbor are not simply two souls floating in space. Rather, the way to connect with the neighbor is within the context of a certain kind of community. Mother Maria says, quote, starting with such a categorical disavowal of all theorizations, especially of the Christian sort, so she doesn't like Christians talking about this all the time, about life, we affirm the necessity in response to all the crises of modernity to simply order life. 
in other words, to form together in some kind of community. Now in this statement, Mother Maria was aware that she was opposing a very strong trend that she noticed among Orthodox people at the time and which of course persists today. And that is to view the point of Christian life as simply the salvation of individual souls, of my own individual soul. So look at quote number six, she continues here. First of all, we must sharply disavow a prejudice shared by even the most diverse people. Among hyper-Orthodox theologians, you may hear that there's no point in ordering life. We've been given but one task to save our soul. And social justice, artistic creativity, scientific work, and, and so forth, none of that matters to us. It's just a job, an obedience that has no decisive impact on our inner life. And so for Mother Maria, this sort of simplistic focus on saving my soul is, a, is really a limitation of the task of the church. And so she counters that, that approach with these affirmations. So continuing that quote there, Christianity is paschal joy. Christianity is co-working with God. Christianity is humanity's acceptance of the responsibility to cultivate the Lord's paradise once rejected in the fall. Among the thickets of this paradise, overgrown by centuries and centuries of the weeds of sin and the thorns of our dry and loveless life, Christianity orders us to uproot to plow, to sow, to weed, and to gather the harvest. Authentic, divine human, holistic, conciliar Orthodox Christianity calls us to the Paschal Hymn. In love, let us embrace each other. And teaches us in each liturgy, let us love one another that with one mind we may confess. Let us love. This means not only unity of mind, but also unity of action. It means a life in common, I hope. This last sentence here is important. She says that when we say in the divine liturgy, let us love one another that with one mind we may confess, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we're talking about not just a common idea, like an agreement, but also a common action, a common life. So this leads me to the second major element of Orthodox actions theology, and that is that a sort of vertical Christianity directed towards service to God and a more horizontal Christianity directed towards service to others are not two different things. The first being the greater path, the second one being kind of the lesser path, but rather for Orthodox Christians, they are, they are the same thing. So social Christianity, quote unquote, is just Christianity. Orthodox action arose in a European context in which Protestants and Catholics were also trying to figure out the relationship between faith and social action. Uh, Mother Maria drew from these influences, but, they, but she criticized their tendency to view social action as a secondary form of Christian life. So look at quote number seven. It's easy to think that a Christianity oriented toward the world is a second rate Christianity. The real one turns piously to God, seeks communion with God, and does not and should not substitute or replace the sweetness of communion with God for anything else. It may be, and it is partly true, that all types of social Christianity that have grown out of the soil of Catholicism and Protestantism have indeed suffered from an insuperable second-rate status. But this has transpired because they address the world on its own terms accepting a secular method of relating to all phenomena of life, even to the human being. Their relationship to God was defined by the commandment to love him, but their relationship to the human being by the laws and rights imminent to humanity. It is necessary that the relationship to the human being and to the world be built not upon human and secular laws, but on the revealed commandments of God. That is to see in the human being the image of God, and in the world, the creation of God. It is necessary to understand that Christianity demands of us not only mysticism of communion with God, but also the mysticism of communion with humanity, which fundamentally leads us to its disclosure of communion with God. Only in such a situation can the second rate status of a world facing Christianity disappear. So in other words, the idea here is that um, uh, communion with others uh, in a kind of mystical way is, is, is something that opens us up to communion with God. In other words, they're not separate. 
Mother Maria expanded this, no, this notion of mysticism uh, with, of human communion in her later writings, including a very important article she wrote in 1939 called The Second Commandment, right? The first commandment being love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, uh, mind, and strength. The second commandment being love your neighbor as yourself. This particular essay was included in a collection of essays for a journal that Orthodox Action created that year called uh, Orthodox Action. It included essays by her and by other members of the group, including Berdyaev, the philosopher, the historian Fyodotov, uh, the literary critic Konstantin Mochulski, and Father Lev Gier. And I'm actually in the process right now of translating these essays. But here's what she says in this essay on the second commandment. So look at quote number eight. Quite often, various exercises in external virtue, feeding vagabonds, sheltering beggars, and so on, are accepted as it were by those who follow the path of self-salvation. This is the kind of individualist approach that she's criticizing. But they're accepted as ascetic exercises useful for the soul. Of course, this is not the love that the gospel teaches us, and it was not for this kind of love that Christ was crucified. No, the poor and unhappy person is indeed poor and unhappy, and in him, Christ is indeed present in a humiliated way, and we receive him in the name of the love of Christ, not because we will be rewarded, but because we are aflame with the sacrificial love of Christ, and in it, we are united with him, with his suffering on the cross, and we suffer not for the sake of our purification and salvation, but for the sake of this poor and unhappy person whose suffering is alleviated by ours. One cannot love sacrificially in one's own name, but only in the name of Christ, in the name of the image of God that is revealed to us in the human being. So in another article from this journal, Orthodox Action, the George Fyodotov connects this social aspect of Christ's commandment, the second commandment, to the social character of the church itself as the body of Christ. Yet the church, he says, is not an abstract society. It is rather the concreteness of Christ's divine humanity in the spirit, a concreteness which is fundamentally social. So look at quote number nine. He says, the church is not made up of the mere combination of its members and is not identical to the sum of its parts. It was there immediately as a whole in the unity of the apostles in the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Here, the whole is not an abstraction, but a primary reality. And for this reason, this whole is called a body, body of Christ, that is the most concrete organic thing in our experience. There is a genuine mystery here, this divine human sociality. And a person who by their own free will weaves together a tapestry of love, connecting it with the people around them, immediately finds himself within the whole, within the universal. Other articles in the Orthodox Action Journal examined this issue from various angles, uh, the notion of social Christianity in the fathers of the church and in modern Orthodox teaching, the crucial differences between a Christian uh, communal sociality and materialist communism, uh, and then in finding the root of compassion or co-suffering in the kenosis or the self-emptying of Christ himself on the cross as he co-suffers with all humanity. All this to say that Orthodox Action, the organization and its members were forming a social Christianity on the ground and using that experience of encounter with the others as the source for theorizing on what social Christianity was about. Now, the third element of the theology of Orthodox Action I wanna highlight here is faithfulness to the small things. Let me give you a quote from Mother Maria, uh, quote number 10. She says, we're ashamed and uncomfortable talking about little things. We're so accustomed to theorize on global scales. We so easily haggle about the limits of government, come up with monies for the unemployed. We operate from within philosophical systems of all epochs and peoples. We weigh and adjudicate the truths of religion. And in all this, we are surprised by nothing and bring forth nothing from our own life. It seems an almost inexcusable and unacceptable naivete to hold forth on anything that does not have a global scope and might even require some lives. And so accepting in advance this rebuke, right, the rebukes of those who want to do grand theorizing, 
accepting in advance this rebuke for the sake of a love for small things, I still want to talk precisely about them, about our small, meager, destitute life. So what, she, what she's sort of saying here is that we're given a short life on this earth. We are blessed to meet only a limited number of people, and the vast majority of us have no power to change the world on a global scale. This is simply a fact of our finitude. Now, from a certain perspective, this fact can bring us to despair. We are bombarded on social media with sort of constant reports of wars and crises and scandals around the world and even in the church. And while it is certainly our task as church to pray for the world and to create solidarity with suffering people around the globe, it is at the same time spiritually dangerous to occupy our minds constantly with worrying about global concerns and problems that we can't control. Because it not only robs us of the opportunity to notice the things around us that we can change, but it's also a theological mistake. Let me explain. For Mother Maria, she says, to occupy oneself with small things is precisely a Christian approach. It is of the logic of the all-powerful God, the creator of the universe, becoming a tiny baby, right? The, the, the universal within the tiny. This is what she writes, quote number 11. The truth of the Lord tells us that heaven cannot contain it, and yet the manger of Bethlehem contained it, that it creates and sustains the world, and yet it collapsed beneath the weight of the cross on the road to Golgotha, that it is greater than the universe, and yet at the same time does not disdain a cup of water given to it by a compassionate hand. The truth of the Lord abolishes the distinction between the uncontainable and the insignificant. I love that line. The truth of the Lord abolishes the distinction between the uncontainable, the huge, and the insignificant. She goes on to affirm that Christ's breakdown of this distinction between the tiny and the huge is precisely how we should think about ordering our lives in community. She says, we are trying to order our small, insignificant life like the great creator ordered the solar system, drew a line across the face of the universe. These are hopeful lines for us as we seek ways to uh, address the suffering of the world and to somehow act as the church together. There's power in the small things, the small encounters, the small acts. So in conclusion, I wanna close with one final uh, rather long quote from Mother Maria, and it speaks to what this work is all about. Fundamentally, it's not about charity. It's not about the haves giving their time and resources to the have-nots. It's more than that. It's, it's an answer carried out not only in theoretical ideas, but also practical action to the question of the meaning of life itself. What makes our life on earth meaningful? Mother Maria's words to the emigre Russian community in France address this larger question, but it's relevant to us and to just about anyone. So look here at quote number 12. To every reader of these lines, I pose the question, do you know how difficult, absurd, lonely, and pointless this is, our common emigre life? You have experienced most likely along your own journey what the word crisis means. Crises of every kind, not only those that have reduced or destroyed your income or have forced your friends to search for happiness in a foreign country. No, there is another crisis that has devastated your soul. It is one that has devastated the soul of humanity, rendered life meaningless, removed from it a certain fundamental center. Do you know that this life crisis is a crisis of faith in God and in the human being? A crisis of the will to manifest the image of God in oneself and its manifestation in one's brother? If you do know this, then we both have an entire massive reservoir of common knowledge from which we must draw basic conclusions. And here they are. Let us construct a new life. We do not want to be executors of charity. We're building our life in common. It's not our fault that this is not a life of a large state or of humanity as a whole. We deal in the small and we want to be true to the small. And we call not only because we actually and truly do need the help of every living person, but also because we need to help and through it to be united to 
towards our joyous and brotherly task. Do my words sound utopian and naive? Perhaps. But you may speak of our naivete and utopianism only when you have your own precise means by which to overcome your little faith, apathy, and lack of wholeness, to fill the emptiness of life. And not only to fill it, but also to, to genuinely create actual, real wholeness. If you feel that your soul is empty when you look at yourself in the mirror, then come to us in order to give us the opportunity to fill it with a love for just such souls, each one of whom is the authentic and magnificent image of God. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>